seated. Good morning, St. Timothy's. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, before we get started, a little note. Uh, his father Grady is away for uh, five weeks. Five weeks? Four weeks? Five weeks? Five. Something like five. Yes, uh, we'll be doing matins today. Next week, uh, Father Joel Stricker will be here to lead us through Holy Communion and Eucharist, and then I'll be here for three consecutive weeks through Labor Day. So today we're doing um, matins, morning prayer. Uh, Tim will lead us in, in a few parts of the liturgy. He'll lead us in singing the liturgy, and I'll, I'll, I'll indicate when that will be. So if you could turn to page three of your liturgy booklet, we will begin uh, the liturgy for this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. If you're able, it's our custom to kneel for confession. <coughs> Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. With me in praying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Grant to your faithful people, merciful Lord, pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please stand. And Tim will lead us in singing. This morning we are going to, I'm going to lead us in saying the Venite. <clears throat> so join with me in saying, O oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, 
and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, O oh, that ye would hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with that generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath, that they should not enter into my rest. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please remain standing as Tim leads us in singing through the psalm. Bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. Bless our God, you peoples. Sorry, you get it? Wrong. That's the wrong psalm. Tim, it'll be Psalm 33 in the um, leaflet. I've got that. That's okay, Tim. It's church. It's okay. <laughs> Our hearts shall rejoice in him, because we have hoped in his holy name. Together. Our hearts shall rejoice in him, because we have hoped in his holy name. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to naught. He makes the devices of the peoples to be of no effect and cast out the counsels of princes. The counsel of the Lord shall endure forever, and the thoughts of his heart from generation to generation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and blessed are the people he has chosen for himself to be his inheritance. The Lord looks down from heaven and beholds all the children of men. From the habitation of his dwelling, he considers all those who dwell on the earth. Our hearts shall rejoice in him because we have hoped in his holy name. He fashions all the hearts of them and understands all their works. There is no king who can be saved by a mighty host. Neither is any mighty man delivered by great strength. A horse is considered a vain hope to save a man. Neither shall it deliver anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon those who fear him and upon those who put their trust in his mercy. Our hearts shall rejoice in him because we have hoped in his holy name to deliver their soul from death and to feed them in the time of famine. Our soul has patiently waited for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. Our heart shall rejoice in him because we have hoped in his holy name. Let your merciful kindness, O Lord, be upon us, as we have put our trust in you. 
our hearts shall rejoice in him, because we have hoped in his holy name. All right, please be seated for our first lesson. Genesis. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks. You can remain seated. Uh, we're going to t uh, say the Te Deum together, bottom of page seven. <coughs> together, let us say, We praise thee, O God. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The Holy Church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee, Father of an infinite majesty, thy honorable, true, and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst not abhor the virgin's womb. When thou hast overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name, ever world without end. Vow us, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy lighten upon us, as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted. Let me never be confounded. The second lesson. A reading from the Epistle of St. Paul to the Hebrews. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, 
though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may remain seated as we say the Benedictus together. You can find that on page 9. <coughs> together let us say, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and he hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which he hath sent since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers, and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he swore to our forefather Abraham, that he would grant us that we, being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him, all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Well, good morning again, St. Timothy's. It's wonderful to see you. It's always a joy to be with you. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, you have me for four of the next five weeks. I uh, hope you won't be too sick of me by the end, and I won't be sick of you all. Uh, Father Grady is away enjoying some well-deserved rest and relaxation time, so we wish him, Carly, Mary, and Frank a wonderful holiday. Hebrews is our text this morning. Now, 
I'll be preaching three consecutive sermons from Hebrews. I don't know what Father Joel will preach you next week. He might preach from Hebrews. It's on the lectionary. Uh, Hebrews is one of my favorite books of the Bible. Uh, it's an often overlooked book. In the New Testament, the Gospels, Paul's letters and Revelation get a lot of the attention, and understandably so. But it would be a mistake to overlook Hebrews. So before I begin, let me say a few words about this very rich book. Hebrews was written sometime between 60 and 95 AD. Uh, we don't know the author of the book. Speculation includes Paul, Barnabas, Priscilla, or Apollos. Those are the four names that would come up the most. But scholars admit that we have very little evidence to confidently say who it was. Hebrews was very likely a sermon. The whole book is likely one sermon. The author says he is giving a, quote, word of exhortation early on in the book. Uh, and there's also some evidence that it was written to a congregation in or near Rome. The author says early on in the book, uh, greetings from those from Italy. And Clement of Rome was already referencing Hebrews in his letters to the early church in 95 AD. Another thing we know about Hebrews is whoever wrote it was a very learned person. The Greek is polished and exquisite. Uh, it's actually one of the best written books of the Bible in the Greek. Don't, I, I'm going on scholars here. I can't tell you this for sure. I don't speak Greek. Um, but this is largely uh, believed to be so. So whoever wrote this book was uh, very educated and intelligent, which would be a big reason why um, certain people think Apollos wrote it, because he was indicated in Acts as being one, maybe the most learned of all the early disciples. So that's one of the reasons his name comes up. But again, we, we can't say for sure. Now, overall, what is the book of Hebrews about? Fundamentally, this book is about the lordship of Jesus Christ, similar to the Gospel of John that way. It's also about how Christ gives us direct access to God, especially in Hebrews 4, one of my maybe my favorite passage in the whole Bible, uh, the end of Hebrews 4. So something to pay, maybe look at later. But that's the idea. Christ gives us direct access to God the Father. No other New Testament book references the Old Testament more. The Old Testament is all over Hebrews. So the author of Hebrews tells us that the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ, and he tells us this over and over again, that we find Jesus in the Old Testament. This morning, a lot of that is sort of earlier on in Hebrews. Uh, the, in the lectionary, the next coming weeks, is the, the, uh, towards the, uh, the latter few books of Hebrews, latter few chapters that we'll be focusing on. This morning, we'll look at the first half of chapter 11, what Nancy just read for us. This chapter contains the famous Hall of Faith section, or Cloud of Witnesses. Uh, these are Old Testament examples of faith. Uh, and again, we have, uh, I believe, four or five in today's reading, but I'll go over that in a moment. Chapter 11 helps us answer a question. What is faith? Few books of the Bible are more clear on what faith is. So we'll look at three things. The nature of faith, some Old Testament examples of faith, and lastly, what faith is for. But first, let's pray. Oh, Lord, we pray for faith. Open our hearts and minds to your word this morning. May we be present to your spirit. Amen. So what is faith? Faith, hope, and love, right? Three great Christian virtues. What is faith? Verses 1 through 3 and verse 6 tell us. Here are verses 1 to 3. Right off the bat, uh, the author of Hebrews is giving us, telling us what faith is. Now, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now, if you'll 
Indulge me for a moment. I've paraphrased those first two verses. Here's my paraphrase. Faith is the confidence that we hope for the right things. Firmly convinced that there is an unseen reality. By faith, our ancestors received approval from God. Now, the author in this um, section, in, uh, in, in verse 3, gives us the example of creation. Okay, what's going on here? We didn't see the process of creation. We have faith that creation comes from an unseen reality, the Word of God. So we don't have evidence of creation, not directly anyway. We have faith in it. If that sounds like what some people call blind faith, just hold tight. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. Now, it is the ancestors that help us understand what faith looks like. Abel is first up, not Adam and Eve, their son. He showed faith by offering an acceptable sacrifice. He hoped in the promise of God, firmly convinced that in God's reality, that God is real. In other words, he had faith. The author also writes this lovely line. I don't know if you caught it. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Isn't that beautiful? Almost poetic. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So Abel's faith has been speaking for millennia speaks to us today. Next up is Enoch. Enoch. Enoch showed faith by being taken up into heaven. Genesis 5. He walked with God, implying that he hoped in the promise of God and that he had confidence in God's reality. In other words, Enoch had faith. In verse 5, we read, this is the verse about Enoch, before he was taken up, he was commended, or, as I rephrase it, received approval as having pleased God. This is important because it leads into verse 6. It's a very important verse in this reading. In this verse we read, And without faith it is impossible to please him, God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This verse breaks up the discussion of ancestral faith. So we have a few of our ancestors discussed, then all of a sudden this verse just appears, and then the author moves on again. So there's something interesting going on here. It's always when you're doing your Bible reading, if there's a, bit, if there's a, a quick sudden change, take notice. And something important is happening. Verse 6 tells us a few things. First, God is only pleased if we have faith. Paul would also like that. Sermon for another time. Second, the author tells us what to have faith in. The existence of God or his reality, God's real, and his blessings on those who seek him. The existence of God and then his blessings on those who seek him. So, to sum up, God approves us when we please him. We please him when we believe he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. A few points, but first, a sip of water. <laughs> oh, just one of those days. So a few points on verse 6 here. It can be easy to understand the word reward. We have to be careful there. Can easy to understand that as the health and wealth gospel, or otherwise known as the prosperity gospel. As Grady and I have mentioned multiple times, it's also a false gospel. Believing in God does not automatically bestow good health and riches. It'd be great if it did, but it doesn't. Not automatically. People who are poor and in bad health are not far from God. I've preached before that in the ancient church, they believed exactly the opposite that the poor and the suffering were very close to God. He drew very near them. So, rewards, in verse 6, does not mean health and wealth. So, what are we rewarded with? Life. We are rewarded with life. 
God shares his life with us when we draw close to him. He does this in Christ through the Spirit who lives and dwells with us. And we receive assurance of eternal life with him. This is our reward for having faith. Life with Christ here as sojourners and then eternal life in the age to come. That is our reward. Another point. I can hear someone say, having faith in God's existence is blind faith. I'm sure we've all heard this, or most of us. Now, blind faith is real. It is a thing, as they would say. I could have faith that I'll live if I jump off a steep, steep cliff. I could have faith that I, I jump off a steep cliff and I, I live. But that faith will be crushed, literally and figuratively. Blind faith is opposed to reason. Reason tells you if you jump from a steep, steep cliff, you'll die. So, so be in tune with reason on that one. But faith in God and his creation is not blind. It is not opposed to reason. It moves beyond reason. Think of it. So I want to use a metaphor here. I hope hopefully this will be clear. So think of it in this metaphorical way. Faith and reasons are partners on our journey to the top of a mountain. So say we're, we're climbing the top of a mountain. Faith and reason are with us. In fact, in a lot of ways, that's literally true. But we, again, for another sermon. Faith, um, but then we are beckoned to keep going on, and reason can't journey with us anymore. We then must leave reason behind as we ascend beyond the mountain. Only faith can journey with us. So faith is not opposed to reason at all. It's, it's actually like a partner with it. They're friends. They're friendly. God has given us both. It's just that sometimes faith is needed to move beyond reason to something greater. Meaning sometimes reason has its limits. And when we reach its limits, we move beyond in faith. Thankful that reason has been with us so far. Blind faith is opposed to reason. Reason is its enemy. That is why our faith in God's existence and his rewards are not blind. Now, Noah's faith wasn't blind. He had hope in the promise that God would save him through an unseen reality, the flood. And that he was firmly convinced it would happen. In other words, he had faith. faith. God said this big cataclysmic event would happen, and he's like, okay. I don't see it, but I have faith that it will happen because I have faith in your reality and your promises. Abraham had hope in the promise that God would bless him and his descendants by going to an unseen land. In other words, he lived in faith. His wife Sarah had hope in the promise that God would bless her with a child even though this seemed like an unseen possibility. In other words, she had Faith. What can this great cloud of witnesses teach us? Do you have hope in the promises of God? By you, I also mean I. I'm not just saying to you, but do we? Are we firmly convinced of God's reality, even though he is unseen? In other words, do we have faith? I'll admit it can be hard to have faith sometimes. It can be hard to have hope in the promises of God in the muck and mire of everyday life. And in our scientific age, it can be hard to be firmly convinced of an unseen reality. But I think our passage can help us understand what faith is for. So I'll close with this discussion. Looking at verses 13 to 16. Here they are. I don't see them fully, but, but um, mostly. <laughs> These ancestors all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. They desire a better country, a heavenly one, for God has prepared for them a city. I love those verses. That's so beautiful. I love it. 
having not received promises. They saw the promises, but greeted them from afar. Very poetic. They are seeking a homeland, a better country. God is preparing for them a city. This, my friends, is our reward. Not health and wealth, though God does grant us that, thank God, through his grace. But our reward is a homeland, a better country, God's prepared city. Faith is confidence that we hope for the right things. If you hope for God's heavenly homeland, you can have confidence that you hope for the right thing. Faith is being firmly convinced in an unseen reality. If you're firmly convinced of God's heavenly homeland, you're convinced of an unseen reality. And if you have faith in these, you have faith that God exists. All of this is pleasing to God. And when we please him, we receive our reward. He shares his life with us while we are strangers and exiles here on earth, so that he may prepare for us our final reward, living in God's city, God's country, with the cloud of witnesses that have gone before us. This is what the author of Hebrews is telling us in chapter 11. He is inviting us to have faith in God through Christ in the Spirit. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, please stand, and Tim will lead us in singing the Apostles' Creed. Take love. 
understanding and hear the collect of the day. Almighty God, give us the increase of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you have promised. Make us love what you command through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. 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 Hear this prayer for mission. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please remain, remain standing, if you are able, for the prayers of the people. please respond with hear our prayers almighty and everlasting God we are taught by your holy word to offer praises and supplications and to give thanks for all people we humbly pray that you would mercifully receive our prayers inspired continually we pray the universal church and the spirit of truth unity and concord and grant that all that confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and God's love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. Special prayers are requested for the following. Peace and Ukraine, Taiwan, Ethiopia, the Middle East, and the Caucasus region. May God, in the midst of the wickedness, draw many to the Prince of Peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. God's guidance, grace, and unity for our St. Timothy's family. God's healing and peace for Tris Bondette, Marion, Derek, Corrine, Sienna, Bill, Linda, Tony, Leslie, Amy, Bobby, Lucy, and Kay. We also pray for Pastor Greedy and his family during his holiday time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our yeah. prayers. We pray for the following churches in the Anglican network of churches Christ Church, Kelowna, and St. Andrew's Church, Delta. In the North Shore, we pray for Hillside Baptist Church and Holy Trinity Roman Catholic Church. God gives strength and direction to the Wycliffe Bible Translation Mission of Sharon Thompson. And in this congregation, bless Ledford Lilly and Daphne Martin. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, help us to reach out to our friends and family who are not walking with you. Show them the peace, hope, and joy of living in your love. Dear God, giver of life, we pray that you will turn Canada into a culture that values and embraces all human life, including the lives of the most vulnerable, the preborn, the elderly, and the handicapped. We pray for all persecuted Christians, give them strength and courage, and God, open the hearts of their persecutors that they may hear your truth and your way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you, world without end. Amen. Amen. Uh, now we will sing a hymn, probably the most well-known hymn today, Amazing Grace, which you can find as a leaflet. Uh, and we'll sing every verse.
before we get to the prayer of general thanksgiving, I just want to say ver, uh, um, in the third verse of the uh, of Amazing Grace, the Lord has promised good to me, his word my hope secures. That fit very nicely, I think, with my dis our discussion of faith this morning. That just stood out to me. What a beautiful hymn. So join with me in saying the general thanksgiving, which you can find on page 13. Together, let us thank God by saying, Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, through your natural love, in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Hear this prayer of St. John Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you, and you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. We now come to a time of announcements, of which I have none. Um, Marilyn. Uh, we have several cards in the back to be signed for people who are not feeling well. Anyone else? Any other announcements? Patty. Um, I'd just like to add to Lucy Singh. She had a full hip replacement yesterday and is hoping to be home either later today or tomorrow. So she's on the mend. Good. Thank you for that update, Patty. Anyone else? Again, you'll have uh, Father Joel Strucker from St. John's, Vancouver. He'll be your officiant next week as I'm away. Um, so there'll be a communion service next week. All right, our final hymn is 186, hymn 186.
perhaps can be infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen.